Okay, I think we should all be back. Thank you so much for participating. I hope you had a fruitful discussion in your groups. What we are going to do now is give each breakout group an opportunity to report back um, their recommendations. I will be sharing my screen to facilitate um, the process. And so what I will do, if I can figure out where I am, uh, let's see. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start group by group with group number one. That's Leah Starita. Thank you very much. If you can share in two minutes or so your recommendations. Thank you. Okay. So I, I think the the um, best motivating uh, use case that we heard, right, was right as like the, the, <laughs> the windows were closing, of course. Um, and that was that um, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, there's a, there's a big consortium and we had multiple members of that in, in the room. And they were thinking about how, you know, each, each group of people with sets of variants are going to need their own kind of therapeutic targets, clinical trials, and uh, and therapeutic strategies in order to really successfully treat uh, this disease. And therefore, understanding QTLs and risk variants and risk genes, um, you really need to understand the genetic context in which those variants are found. And you know, so we just we were discussing really what if. These genetic descriptors really needed to be there, um, and we all decided we need something um, in order to understand the genetic context of where either these cell lines or tissues were coming from. Um, but what that really needs to describe is the local, uh, local, and kind of global uh, genetic and potential uh, environmental. Um, context uh, that these cells or or tissues had seen uh, in order to really understand the underlying cellular and physiological mechanisms that were kind of being discovered that describes the biology and, and pathology. Um, and therefore, um, you know, in order to really thoroughly describe the biology and pathology, we also, um, you know, it is not surprising, need to have large representation across all populations to get um, this biological understanding to get therapeutic targets um, and treatments uh, to the right people. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that that's not really a surprise, but I think that the number, the, the underlying what's under number one is really being able to understand the context um, was something I think I was a little bit um, more surprised uh, to, to hear. Thank you, Liam. For that. And so just as a reminder, once we're done with all these report back, we'll have time for discussion. So hold on if you have any questions or comments until we com complete all the reports back. Okay, so we will go to group number two focused on gene discovery, and that is Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so our group of camp with sort of three overarching recommendations with sort of some sub bullet points that are on here. I think the the main one um, is the importance of distinguishing between descriptors used for ascertainment um, and descriptors used for genetic analysis. Because um, with uh, you know one of the limitations of legacy data is that um, descriptor that people were ascertained in a specific way um, that might not necessarily be um, perfectly matched to a study. Um, so it's really important to. Um, to account for ascertainment um, and then describe exactly how the genetic analysis was done. Um, and then um, uh, sort of a, a related point is that it's very important to describe study design and ascertainment um, when reporting how that legacy data um, uh, was used. So for every study that goes into an analysis, um, to be very uh, clear about how um, uh, population descriptors were um, were identified, how individuals were labeled, um, and to be as specific as possible um, when you're reporting a population. So don't just say, you know, round everyone up to the closest continental group, but um, in, uh, include the most specific information you po have possible. Um, and then um, uh, another recommendation is to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, because, you know, 
we are trying to use all the resources that have been developed in, in legacy data sets um, and sort of do the best science that we can um, given a lot of the limitations. Thank you very much. Very succinctly done. We're doing great here. Okay, group number three. That is the group focused on trade prediction with David Conti. Okay, and unfortunately, uh, we did not make it to the recommendations, but we had a very lively discussion. Um, just to, to to summarize in terms of the trait prediction uh, and the use of legacy data um, specifically for polygenic risk scores, uh, legacy data is typically used in terms of uh, summary statistics uh, from consortiums that are often defined around uh, continental ancestry groups um, at best. And even if they are sort of diverse and sort of how you can use those summary statistics, you're still... Uh, there is a limitation to sort of the granularity of the diversity that those summary statistics uh, represent. Uh, the next uh, is sort of the application of, of sort of taking polygenic, constructed polygenic risk scores uh, into existing cohorts uh, to really sort of uh, evaluate uh, and build uh, models for trait prediction. And, and their uh, cohorts are often homogeneous, or at least legacy cohorts are often homogeneous. Um, and even in uh, a diverse cohort, such as the multi-ethnic cohort, uh, race and ethnicity as a population descriptor uh, can do very well for defining uh, differences across populations for trait prediction. Genetic similarity can be used as a substitute uh, to then, uh, and can work well as a variable for trait prediction. Um, but there was a discussion around the concern of using genetic similarity uh, as a as a variable um, may over assign sort of um, genetic risk to that or over interpret uh, risk in a genetic context when it's really sort of capturing non-genetic risk factors. Um, and so the discussion led to, well, we certainly would like to uh, have um, better um, variables, social determinants of health type variables and other things to include in these models that would capture that risk. But again, in legacy data, uh, that will be limited. Um, and so uh, we had a discussion, uh, and again, I think this is a common theme about being very clear about when and where to use certain variables. And sometimes um, a sort of uh, legacy labels may be useful even for trait prediction in certain contexts. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for summarizing that. Uh, moving on to group number four, focused on health disparities. And here, Esteban Gonzalez Bouchard, floor is yours. Okay. So um, we we talked about some of the legacy data and, and much of the older legacy data relied on self-identified race ethnicity and a limited number of variables. And so, so there's only so much utility we can get out of that. Um, not all of them uh, included genetic testing, so we agreed that going forward, we need better uh, ascertainment of, of, of groups, populations that include multiple variables, not just uh, self-identified race, but genetic ancestry and then social factors. And that brings us to uh, a very important uh, part that hits home. We need to encourage study sections to support group, multidisciplinary groups, of uh, whether they're clinical groups with social epidemiologists, with environmental epidemiologists, and geneticists. And those are the sorts of the types of groups that will really be able to address many of the key topics that we would like to address. Um, we also have to be pragmatic that for clinical measures, as in, say, lung function, in which would, uh, I'm met expertise at, it's not pragmatic to include every variable under the sun, air pollution. Uh, having said that, we rec uh, I recognize that many of my colleagues, say, in India, will argue strongly that dietary factors are the biggest driver of lung function, whereas other people will say it's is so, um, environmental air pollution. Other people will say it's ancestry. Um, I, I do want to, I did add a warning um, that, and I want to remind this entire group that the Buffalo, New York shooting, uh, the uh, the murderer 
uh, put in his manifesto a cited a nature genetics paper as the reason that that justified his killing of 10 African Americans. And I and other people had mentioned respecting um, institutional review boards or uh, human consents. So when data are collected and put into national repositories, um, investigators like me, we lose control over the IRBs. And so in my case, children were consented for asthma, but then ultimately used for comparative genetics to monkeys. And so uh, we need to respect the IRB controls. And uh, in some ways, that's that's a limitation, but in some ways, that's we have to be mindful and be um, uh, respectful of the IRB consents. Thank you very much. Okay, moving to group number five on human evolution and population genetics. And Alex, the floor is yours. Hi, Rob. Thank you. So I think we had a, a pretty wide discussion and a lot of great points came up that we have in our notes. Uh, but for the, the two, just to, to read out, I think the first one that, that was discussed quite a bit is on PCA. We've been seeing a, a lot of PCA as a continuous method that also, um, you know, it, it is, it's, you know, shows the full continuum of, of diversity, and it also allows us to maybe compute distances in, in that space. And there was just a desire to sort of emphasize that it itself, PCA itself, is not unbiased and not truly unsupervised. It is technically an unsupervised machine learning technique, but it is influenced, the axes are influenced by your sampling scheme. And and often people, you know, have certain thoughts in their mind already about the, the number of samples they're going to take from each group, and that will influence basically, um, which groups define the, the first few principal component axes, and, and then the entire space is now influenced by by your, your you know, sort of uh, preconceptions. So, so it's not a complete solution, and there isn't a great complete solution. Uh, structure and admixture, these clustering plots can also be influenced by sampling scheme. So we just wanted to, to, to think about that and, and raise awareness. Um, and then the other point um, is just uh, important to be aware of the limitations of the current public data sets that are used as references, such as thousand genomes. Not that there's something wrong with those samples, but that they are not comprehensive. There are many regions, um, you know, the Middle East, for example, in thousand genomes or, or continents that are not uh, well covered. Africa would be one. Um, there, there's certainly many samples from Africa and thousand genomes, but it, but there's really a huge diversity, of course, in Africa, and and that's not captured. This, you know, samples don't really span the whole continent, and so when using this as the basis uh, to sort of project samples on to construct some sort of a, a genetic space to measure distances within for for PRS scores or anything like that, it's just important to be aware that we still have a lot of work to do uh, to to build out you know, more comprehensive uh, data sets that capture all of the human, you know, genetic diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Group five. Group number six, focus on non-health outcomes, and that is Latrice Landry. Hi. Um, we also had a very lively discussion. Um, one of the recommendations that we thought about were considering um, the language we use when describing a data set as a part of a data set repositories, um, and then also the use of language describing populations um, in the um, proposal or data request um, and heavily suggest, um, and, and that the language should heavily suggest that the um, investigators actually thought about the impact of population, the use and impact of population descriptors. Um, additionally, we thought that it would be important, um, an important resource uh, for researchers in this space are thinking about the translational or translational epidemiologic framework, but there have been many adaptations of that that sort of takes the spectrum of research from discovery all the way into public health impact and practice and just thinking about that as a guide or a tool to help researchers think about the impact of their own research as they think about populations and population descriptors. Also, um, access to le legacy data sets. Um, and there was a suggestion that we, we think about a training or access um, program uh, 
quiz or a questionnaire that might be required to access legacy data sets, similar to what's done in the All of Us Workbench, where um, investigators using the, the data set have to um, take a training and, and do that on an annual basis. And we weren't sure what the exact framework or composition of that would be, but that that would be helpful in helping investigators who are using legacy data um, be thoughtful about the use of population descriptors. Um, we also thought that the NASM table could be customized as needed um, and a specific suggestion about how we think about time, um, both the time set or the timeline that the data set was uh, acquired and also the proposed research. Um, and address stability and alignment of the selected population descriptors between the data set and the research. The idea here that how populations, even uh, population descriptors such as race, have changed over time in the context of just the US. Um, and so thinking about time, thinking about geography also as we think about those population descriptors should probably be defined. Um, as well as um, the the last two recommendations relate to sort of idea of a data review access board, which um, does exist for legacy data uh, sets, but that the access board should think about the population descriptors and use of population descriptors as a part of their review process. Um, and then thinking more broadly about educating the broader community about population descriptors. So um, the idea that in uh, or, or concern is in non-health outcomes, we thought we should be explicit on whether um, you could actually meaningfully um, look at uh, both genetic similarity or ancestry, for instance, for education or SES or those non-health outcomes. And we thought that um, we should Although we, we couldn't identify a, a use case for it, we didn't want to be uh, sort of um, definitive that there are no use cases for non-health outcomes specific to uh, certain uh, areas, like education, income, but that perhaps we take that uh, approach um, that was uh, also in, illustrated in all of us where you think, uh, uh, where investigators need to think about the harm um, and um, not engage in research that could cause harm to a group. So that was uh, the take home for that in terms of the non-health outcomes. Thank you so much for that good summary. And then the final group is the clinical diagnostic group and led by Mildred. Yeah, thanks. And shout out to our group and to Jamil for taking notes. It was a mad scramble because ideas were fast and furious. So I'm gonna rely on the rest of my group to fill in where I missed some things. But we first started talking out about how there's sort of um, multiple use cases within the use case of even variant interpretation and genomic medicine implementation. Um, I think the sense was that the, the predominant use cases for uh, using allele frequencies as um, where it's used as a sort of proxy for probability of having a variant or a particular pathogenic uh, and also for pathogenicity. Um, but there were other um, use cases such as what we've heard um, in terms of um, assessing uncertainty in PRS for, and um, also, um, uh, so I think overall though, there were a couple of different types of um, uses. One is predominantly to assess, uh, to be able to interpret um, the genetic results of an, a particular individual uh, patient and, uh, and assess that uh, based on um, uh, population data, and also um, to try to understand where we are missing data um, in the data sets that we're using. Um, and so I guess we could jump, uh, we're on the recommendations here. So um, there were several recommendations, and I think overall the sense was that um, the population descriptors that we're using, especially race and ethnicity, are basically not really working in clinical practice um, and that we should try to move away from those in general. Um, and uh, that we should also move beyond sort of targeting methods, targeting specific populations, because the danger there is, of course, that um, we'll be inappropriately or, or um, mistakenly um, identifying people at, as being um, 
for example, of, of low risk of a condition when uh, just based on their population descriptor, um, which we know that in, in clinical practice that uh, um, are uh, not well aligned with uh, genetic similarity. Um, and so I think some of the recommendations were to support more um, uh, functional follow-up of variants so that we can directly assess causation and phenotypes rather than depending on variant frequencies or other proxies, um, and to develop metrics to um, be able to uh, evaluate the completeness of data sets. Um, and so some of the ways in which we might have to retain the use of population descriptors, at least for the time being, is to better assess the way uh, in which our data sets um, are not representing certain populations. Um, and we don't have, we can't use genetics to assess um, that because they're not in the data sets already. Um, so I don't know if other people in our group want to add anything. Thank you, Mildred, for summarizing for your group. So we have now heard from all groups and we have a little time left for discussion. So I would love to open this up now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that um, and open it up for Q and A. Hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, well, there's there's one question remaining for um, Dr. Miga, but any any questions on what we have discussed? Any of the recommendations? Um, Anna, I see, I think I see your hand. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to comment that, um, of course, yeah, the NASA report was charged with covering research use cases. And today we had all but one of the groups focused on research and just one on the clinic. Whereas I think our subgroup showed that there's just so many use cases and there could easily have been like, you know, as many as the, of the research breakout groups as they could have been on the on the clinical group. So I just, yeah, uh, great summary, Mildred. I just goes to show that there's a lot of a lot of potential and need for thinking things still on the clinical side. Thank you, Anna, for that comment. Yes, yes, indeed. So I would I see your hand, Esteban. But one second, I I uh, wanted to comment that John has joined us, and um, I know that you had prepared some remarks. We don't have a lot of time, but if you want to give us a kind of a high level summary of or if you have any thoughts you wanted to share before we move on with the Q&A. Sure. Um, great. So, yeah, my apologies. A kind of spectacular failure of uh, of uh, reading the schedule and um, was sort of logistically in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um but uh, no, in my comments, I was going to um, go over the uh, decision tree in relationship to legacy data, um, help sort of flesh out uh, use cases, but maybe um, and, and prompt some thoughts for discussion for the breakout groups. I had a, a kind of a couple of um, spitball uh, suggestions that for discussion. One of them that was the idea of trying to encourage transparency about community engagement and original consent commitments. And the idea there is in relationship to the Creative Commons license, where you may have seen like material that's that is distributed under the Creative Commons license has these icons that indicate that, for instance, um, the credit must be given to the creator or it's not for commercial use or no derivative or adaptations are permitted. And um, so it's a, a simple schema for the sharing of work and what it can and indicates what the work can be used for downstream. Um, and I wondered if cohorts could have something similar in the context of uh, consent commitments, for example, an icon that or, or, or symbol or, or just a yes, no in a table that is maintained on um, for all the cohorts about whether the labeling is free to be relabeled or whether the samples need to be labeled as given um, you know, as is in the original um, uh, uh, cohort data release? Or is it okay to aggregate the data with larger data sets? Is the data okay to use for population studies? I think there are a few, maybe four or five basic questions that could be answered yes, no, and indicated for every cohort. If we maintained a table like this or some kind of easy way to communicate that, it would be really helpful for 
um, that part of community engagement and respecting as we, uh, that was part of the NASM report. So that was sort of a, a colorful idea to maybe throw out to the breakout groups. I apologize, this is sort of after the fact. Um, ideas about uh, merging samples in terms of, while PCs aren't perfect, are we at the stage where it'd be helpful for the field to define maybe one or a few reference sets of PCs where everybody projects onto those PCs and then says, you know, these samples are in cluster one of PC space or quadrant one or quadrant five or quadrant eight. And we all kind of know that quadrant eight is highly enriched with people of this part of the world or this ethnicities, but we're not talking about it as an e equating ethnicity or geography with the genetic ancestry. We're, we're, we're using sort of our knowledge of a field as a field of the general genetic space that we, you know, our sample sizes today give us uh, insight on. Um, and then maybe also wondering if we should be thinking about developing software, like uh, helpful software infrastructure for accomplishing basic tasks in this world where genetic similarity is prioritized. Um, I think that there are a lot of good ideas, but they're sort of clunky to do in practice. And a lot of different research groups don't have the the facility or, or experience to kind of pull those off. Do we need some sort of software packages? What would those look like that would allow us to sort of streamline merging and matching samples by genetic similarity versus uh, the the crudeness of matching on ethnicity or geography labels. So those are some food for thought. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I could go longer, but we have limited time. But I appreciate you still giving me a chance to uh, share my thoughts. And I apologize again for the logistical uh, mistake. Thank you, John. We really appreciate it. Those, those are really three um, great ideas that you shared. Um, so I'd, I'd like to to ask if there are any reactions to any of those ideas or any other um, thoughts and recommendations that any anyone would like um, to share at this time. Any thoughts on on the idea of defining a few reference p? Oh, sorry, Stephanie, I see your hand. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I had a, a response to the sort of defining reference precis. I think that using a consistent reference can make a lot of sense in the context of a specific consortium or a specific project. We've talked about doing that in the primed consortium since we're collecting you know, data from lots of different legacy studies and trying to sort of use it in a harmonious manner. But I'm, I would be wary of trying to come up with one set of reference data for the entire field and saying like everybody who writes a genetics paper should use this same reference because I think then we would run the risk of never being exploring alternatives of people who are left out of the reference or of the possible or you know potential benefits of different references or you know looking at um at you know, you know different types of populations and that we might we also run the risk of of sort of coming to view that as like the truth and like this is like the you know the one space on which we can establish genetic ancestry is a thing that is real instead of a thing that is estimated and um you know and and always keep in our minds as we're talking about genetic similarity that is very reference dependent um and that we should not be viewing it as some kind of truth with a capital T thank you stephanie um audrey are you commenting on this topic or something else i i am okay. um i was wondering if having version, some kind of version control might help address that where we could have the best kind of current reference under a current version and then it's updated and released. Um, it's not going to fix everything, but it might uh, help address it a little bit. Any comment, any other comments related to the PCA recommendation or suggestion that John uh, put forward PCA references. Um, yep. Okay, Marilyn, and then Latrice. Um, I'm a little stuck. I'm a program officer at NIA. Um, we're kind of stuck with OMB right now and what they're calling things. Are we at a point where we can transit away from that? Great question. Latrice, can you answer this one, or do you are you commenting on the other topic? Don't know what. 
I don't know that I have the expertise to answer that question, but I will just say that I think everyone is kind of stuck with OMB based on sort of the, especially those who are using EHR data records and, and a lot of the previous um, data collection, but I would absolutely leave that open to someone else to answer in a more definitive way. Well, we're going to have to use the word race then, just so everybody knows. Esteban, I see your hand. I think it's related to, to this. I see your message. Go ahead. It is. Um, first, I put in the the citation for the Buffalo shooting. Um, it's by Jediah Carlson and Brenna Hen. Um, regarding that last question about the o o OMB, um, I would, the FDA has mandated that all pharmaceutical companies um, diversify their clinical trials based on race, ethnicity. And that mandate went into effect this May, May of 2024. So pragmatically and practically speaking, I would like to hear what people suggest on what pharmaceutical companies should use. Are we stuck to OMB criteria or should we use what John suggested or anything else? And I see a number of comments in the chat about this, which I'll go ahead and, uh, Kyle, unless you want to amplify, but I think you're saying general feeling is that the OMB category should be elicited specifically for the purposes of reporting to the NIH, but that the science does not need to be based on these categories. And I see a couple of people hearted it and a few people thumbs up. So do you want to say um, something else, Kyle, about this, amplify? And then Jen also um, commented. I mean, I, I, Jim probably knows a lot more about this than I do, but I, uh, yeah, I just think um, it, it might be necessary to even have two different um, questions about, you know, population descriptors or even more than two. One, literally just so we can tell the NIH what the response was, but then every, you might in, uh, listen all different kinds of other population descriptors, depending on what your scientific question is. And I think the same idea would apply to the FDA as well. Um, I, I don't think we can get out of the reporting, but that doesn't mean we need to, to have the OMB dictate what the science is and how it should be done. Lucy, I see you've added a comment. Discussions at NHGRI about distinguishing between the mandatory reporting and the scientific inquiry. Thank you for putting that up. And Mildred also a comment, the OMB categories were specifically designed to assess discrimination by race, ethnicity, and gender. So that's a different purpose than the underlying genetic study, <clears throat> which goes back to the whole point of the NASM report, which is to be thoughtful about the population descriptors and the use cases. Latrice, I'm going back to you, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking about the OMB classifications in relation to sort of John's suggestion earlier about the PCAs. And I think that having a reference set of PCAs um, that could be sort of updated or a collection of PCAs might be something that's useful for those who are not innovating in the field of how we describe population descriptors, how we think about ancestry, I think we definitely don't want to require because we want that innovation because as we see, we don't have the answer yet on how to do this. Um, but for those who are not looking to help the field move or, or whose research is not specifically designed for this purpose, I think that having a reference or having a guideline um, may be useful, but I do think that we would need to have very explicit descriptions of the studies that the PCAs were derived from so that people could gauge whether their populations um, relate to the populations in the reference study um, with beyond just broad geographical or continental ancestry. And so I think if we have very detailed um, descriptions of the study populations, which include other population descriptors um, outside of the ancestry base, maybe um, some of the uh, things that we talked about in the social determinants of health that might help people sort of gauge the similarity of their populations to the populations in the reference. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Nora, I also see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, you know, I want to build on this uh, where Latris was, was talking about. Um, I think, uh, you know, 
this continental ancestry that we had used so far, it's obviously not ideal. But when we move for genetic similarities, uh, I just want to bring up that there will be some populations, again, we already discussed this, not represented in references, and we may be harming this this these populations. We also, there's some populations that don't want that we report that. So for example, work American Indians, and they don't want us to report anything in relation to similarity in terms of population. That's not, so, so it, it, then it will be very difficult for specific groups that suffer from you know discrimination and can have harm if we actually reporting their similarity. I just, just want to bring up this. I'm not saying that um, you know I, I like this new concept, but I think we also when we jump into put recommendations, they can get you know uh, well accepted by you know around the genetic world and epidemiology world. We need to be very careful to look at all these different aspects, and and I, I'm actually really concerned about populations that are not being represented that are going to be labeled uh, in some way um, using this, uh, you know, this new. Any any comments related to Nora's comment on genetic similarity? Go ahead, Alex. Sorry, I can't find the uh, ability to raise my hand, huh? so I just did it physically. Um, I think I guess I, I also had somewhat maybe related concern, just I, I like the idea of a standardized PCA because it makes things much easier for, for people who are not trying to innovate uh, you know in the population genetic space, as John was pointing out. I just wonder what that will look like in practice because we will have to choose some specific populations and, and choose which axes we want uh, to, to have present. And it seems like that could go down another sort of uh, you know, a whole, a whole nother path or rabbit hole of, of what are the populations that matter to us and what, you know, how, what it just goes back into the category space in some level, again, you know, is our populations in, in New Guinea really that relevant to us in the U S so do we not really have them well represented? And, but then is this going to be something that's used internationally and, and now we're putting our judgment into it. So I just, seems like in practice, there might be some interesting questions around it. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to see what's in the chat. Um, anyone else have, we have five minutes, so a little bit of time still for discussion. Um, Anna, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, just in reaction to Esther Van's comment in the chat. Like, I think it's, why do they think diversity is important? If it's because they're worried that they're not capturing underlying genetics, which might impact the outcome of the trial, then think about the best way that that genetic diversity is captured and try and you know sh show that you that the, the trial has that relevant diversity. Is it if, is it because they want to make sure that like basic standards of inclusion are important? Well, then maybe like the O and B categories are important, but like think about the ways that diversity is important to that trial and make sure that the trial is capturing those uh, axes of diversity and reporting on those. Of course, you also have to meet whatever their minimum standards are, but but showing like the logic about why diversity matters um, is is like, I think the most important thing. Thank you, Anna. And I see a comment here. Um, so the question from Esteban was, what should we convey to pharmaceutical companies when they are trying to diversify clinical trials? And Anna just commented, I see also here a comment on, we need more emphasis on causal models. And another comment, it should not cost much to genotype clinical trial participants with a microarray instead of using self-reported race. So a few, a few comments here. And then Esteban posted an example. Um, Peter, I see your hand next. Um, yeah, really quick on uh, the common reference. Um, I just want to underscore what Alex was saying is that that's going to be very dependent on who's in that reference. Uh, and again, it met, that reference may be blind to genetic variation that's in your sample that you're particularly interested in. Um, and then uh, also conceptually, though, uh, this is a very, very loose analogy, so I'm somewhat hesitant to make it. 
Um, but I wonder if this is analogous to the OMB categories, right? So it's more a way of sort of keeping score and like tracking the diversity that's in our study. Not necessarily that you would use it to answer some of the scientific questions you have in mind. Um, uh, so, I mean, in that sense, it could be, it could be, it could be very, very useful. Um, and finally, I'll just say, I cut out all the causal inference stuff for my talk. So, <laughs> so I agree, we should be, we should be thinking very carefully about um, uh, making causal inferences from genetic studies. So, <laughs> Thank you for those comments. Jen? Yeah, I mean, I think I just have a very quick comment, I think, is that you know, I think it's important to note that you can have <clears throat> multiple descriptors at once in a study, and then also you can use them for different parts of your paper, right? It's, you can use OMB for reporting to NIH, but not include it in your table one year analysis. You can use genetic similarity for part of the methods to get at the point, and then also contextualize within these sort of broader societal contexts, right? And so the, the, the point is that you're supposed to really you know, not try to have this one size fits all and not even just across studies, but even within a study to use things more precisely for what you're trying to get at. Um, and I think keeping that in mind helps uh, to sort of clarify why you're using it in that very specific instance, right? And not trying to generalize to every step of your analysis because it's not, you really wouldn't do that with any other variables in, in genetic space that we talk about. So why would you do it with this? Um, and so just to, to, to pick that apart, and, and I don't think it's that you can't, you know, there's been conversations about you can't have any labels, um, but again, just because you, it's not maybe the most appropriate thing for a part of your analysis doesn't mean it's not relevant for the contextualization of your results or for the interpretation or for the accountability aspects of, of equity and knowing who's included, um, and just to have all those different aspects. That's it. Thank you, Jen. Okay, I see um, one comment. Laura, are you willing to make your comment out loud or should um, do you want to amplify it? Um, yeah, sure. I just, um, it, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about um, using, for example, OMB categories, which are, of course, let's just remember that that's specific to the US and, you know, cohorts are recruited globally. Um, but, you know, there's there's one aspect of reporting to your funder um, who you've included in your cohort. But, you know, there are many times when people are excluded from analyses. And for example, we see this in UK Biobank all the time, like 70% of GWAS published in UK Biobank are restricted to the white British subset. So I think it is really important to that researchers have language that they're encouraged to use to be honest about the biases in their data set. And I am, I am concerned that by not using any kind of description of the the population used in an analysis that that somehow becomes obscured um and i have seen examples of that actually in the GWAS field where um you know people try and use kind of alternative language but um actually at the end of the day they've they've only used the white europeans um and that you know that we're, we're not solving that problem i think the issue of um diversity is not is not is far from solved um in genomics Thank you, Laura. That's a great, great way to end this this session. Um, we are now um, ready for a short break until 205 Eastern, and then we will do our final session. Thanks for hanging in there with us um, until we come back at 205 with a summary of what we have learned. Thank you very much. <laughs>